sometimes you all are going to hear me use words like spirit, spirituality, spiritual. When you hear me use those words, what I'm really talking about is connection. Connection. We are connected. We are connected to people, living and dead, to place, to land, experiences. We are connected to ourselves, at least that is our hope, and to that which is beyond our understanding. And sometimes, sometimes we have a say in those connections, right? And sometimes we don't. But the connection is nonetheless real and impactful, however much control we believe we do or do not have. I don't know about the rest of you, I'd like control sometimes. So, so, really? <laughs> Somebody said sometimes. <laughs> For those of you at home who did not hear that, someone was being snarky with me is what just happened. It's fine. I have an almost six-year-old. I'm used to the snark. <laughs> And it is warranted <laughs> most of the time. In this place, in this place, this land, with all its stories, people, and energies that are, that are new to me, but that I am feeling some connection to now, I find myself asking a lot of questions. Questions about place and displacement, about scarcity and abundance. Who has power and where does it come from? What does it mean to be resourced or to experience a lack thereof? Why are there not more Native Hawaiians and other Black and Indigenous and non-Black people of color in this place, Amen. in this faith that I love so much? All of those questions, of course, lead to more questions. <laughs> They lead to more questions. And, and I found myself, um, thankfully, uh, in this, this wonderful Five Practices of Welcoming Congregations worksheet um, that First Unitarian uses, right? Because I have questions, I wanna know things, so I'm looking everywhere. <laughs> and I find this, this wonderful worksheet that I have been using um, to hone in on significant moments, um, significant moments particularly in Hawaiian history and futures. It's history that I did not know History that, believe it or not, we're not taught stateside. And it was there, thankfully, that I discovered that Thursday, July 7th, marked the 120-something uh, observance anniversary of Hawaiian annexation. July 7th is annexation day. As you can imagine, I've been reading a lot. Of course, it was the 4th of July. I started reading about colonization because that's the kind of thing I do. Because <laughs> I'm weird like that. Um, you know, I've been reading about all kinds of things, about uh, American and, and British missionaries coming here as early as the 1820s to convert Hawaiians to Christianity. I read about people reporting of fertile soil and good climate conditions that of course attracts wealthy investors. Right? I read about agreements that intertwined, intertwined the Hawaiian economy with the U.S. economy, particularly around sugar crops and Hawaii becoming economically dependent on U.S. trade. None of these things are by accident. They don't happen just because. There's a strategy in that, as I hope we all know. I read about the planter elite pressuring the Hawaiian government to limit monarchical authority, establishing property qualifications to vote. None of this should be unfamiliar. And if it is, I really encourage us to know the history of the places where we are. Of course, denying suffrage to Native Hawaiians as well as to the larger Chinese and Japanese immigrants Populating population laboring in the sugar fields, maneuvering and scheming on the part of U.S. planter elites, shifts in power, big and small debates at every level of conversation. And of course, the Spanish-American War of 1898, 
that the resources of Hawaii would support led to annexation being voted in by a joint resolution of the US Congress that same year. You folks know this history? It's, it's hard history. Much of our history is. All of this in our democratic system of government. The events I just highlighted, and, and there are many more that I could name, um, right, relative to, to annexation, happened long ago, and we are so deeply, so still deeply impacted by them, even in this very moment, because we're all here. <laughs> we're all here, and our connection to this land, this place, would likely have been different, right? Had those events happened differently or had not happened at all. There's much we could do. There's a whole lot we could say relative to these ideas and this history. But what I want us to think about today um, is, is about voices. That is a word we've heard a lot already, yes? Voices. I want us to think about voices, individual and collective voice, and how voices being heard can affect how connected we feel to place, to people, and even to a deeper understanding of a faith that's supposed to hold us and keep us when the world feels terrible. And as a UU, my deeper reflection and study has taken me to our fifth principle. Does anyone know our fifth principle? I'm not, I'm not pressuring anybody, I promise. I'm not testing anybody. Let me just say it. The right of conscience and the use of the democratic process within our congregations and in society at large. See where I'm going? <laughs> I'll be honest with you. When I was beginning to make um, a home in Unitarian Universalism, I thought it a little bit strange, just a little, that a religious body would include a commitment to a political ideology in its defining principles. That felt odd to me. How can we hold in such high regard the notion that we each enter this place from so many different perspectives, while at the same time holding fast to only one particular way of giving voice to our hopes and desires as communities? How is, it, how is that even possible? How do, we, how do we do that? Have we figured out how to do that? Have we figured out how to do that well? I don't know. And then, of course, I'm reminded that Unitarian Universalism is based on two religions born in the formative years of the American Republic, each decisively influenced and shaped by the same ideas and values that gave rise to the American Revolution and American democracy. Democracy. Benjamin Rush is the signer of the Declaration of Independence, which is universalist. Joseph Priestley, the scientist and preacher who helped found Unitarian churches throughout Britain and the U.S., greatly influenced people like Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, and John Adams, all of whom also espoused similar beliefs. These men's religious convictions were at the heart of their formulation of America's political creed. For example, just one example, the political notion that a people have the right to self-government, that grows out of a religious conviction that human beings have the capacity to shape their own destiny. That's where that comes from. It's an expression of faith in the power of human beings to shape their own lives. One of the unique characteristics and basic tenets of a democracy is that its citizens get to vote figuratively and literally, and that each citizen is able to live the life of their choosing. <laughs> live the life of their choosing. There's some lives that I know some of us wouldn't choose, but that many of us are forced to live in our democracy. 
At the heart of Unitarian Universalism's fifth principle is the notion that we bring to life our inner sense of what is good and right by engaging the democratic process in our congregations. As we delve more deeply into the hopes of our association of congregations, it becomes important to think critically, though, right, um, about how this long-standing and deeply held process has both helped and hindered the building up of the world we dream about. We have to remember, after all, that these deeply held principles were not meant for all of us. They are lovely to read. <laughs> Aren't they? They are lovely to read. But they were not meant for the female identified people in this room. Or for the male identified people in the room who don't own property. They certainly weren't meant for people who look like me. <laughs> what does our right of conscience and the use of the democratic process offer us then? What do these ideals actually say about this country, particularly when one considers the shenanigans that had to have taken place over years for the U.S. to effectively overthrow the Hawaiian monarchy, <laughs> right? John Dewey, who was a philosopher and a psychologist, a major voice of progressive educational reform in the early part of the 20th century, he believed that democracy was most powerfully exemplified in society, not just by extending the right to vote, but by prioritizing communication that is effective enough to ensure a fully formed public opinion. What does that mean? All that really means is that every citizen, expert or not, politician, progressive or not, would have a voice. And each of those voices together would serve as a foundation for who a community is. Reverend Parisa Parsa, who is a wonderful minister in our faith, puts it this way. Her words are very poetic and beautiful. It's the turning of one's heart toward another than away from connection to others. The opening and the willingness to be vulnerable that come of the deepening life of faith. Religiously, our commitment, she says, to the democratic process asks us to bring our piece of revelation, our knowledge of grace, into relationship with others in the place where God dwells in them. And it invites us to live communally from that kind of openness. That's an openness that is, that is hard to spot in some of our spaces. Beautiful ideas and hopes, the work for which cannot just exist in the utterance of the words. We can't just say the words. We have to mean it and make risky, perhaps life-altering moves to make it real. System breakdown happens when we as a people make movements forward, but how we make meaning of those movements remains kind of stagnant and stale. When we hold up any long-standing principle without an assessment of how effective it continues to be as times and people change, that principle or process becomes itself a kind of creed. I've had more than one, I'll say discussion. <laughs> I was going to say disagreement or argument, but we'll, we'll say discussion. <laughs> more than one discussion with folks who are like, we are a creedless faith. Are we though? Are we? Because there are some things that people are holding on to pretty tight around here. <laughs> Just because we don't call it Christianity doesn't mean it's not creedal. <laughs> right? And when we have more faith in the process than in each other, we can lose sight of our covenantal relationships with each other. We can lose sight of so much if we don't ask the hard questions about whether or not there is another way to come together and stick together, we may not even realize who we've left out or left behind. And for those who have gone, we may never fully understand the extent to which we've welcomed and engaged them merely at arm's length. 
at arm's length. I want to share just a quick story before we go, before I go. I'm actually reminded of a dancer I encountered in church one Sunday morning uh, at a church I frequented in the early days of my church life, um, which actually began in my 20s. So I was not a child when this happened. We'd had powerful worship that day, and the music had us all on fire. It was incredible. And at the end of worship, during the closing song, I believe it was, there was a young man who I knew had AIDS and had been quite sick earlier that year. He suddenly got up from his seat and started dancing. He'd been a ballet dancer before he got sick, and according to congregants who knew him well, had not danced in years. That day he danced. He got up and was dancing it literally in the aisle during the closing song. It was probably one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. Up and down he moved with his arms outstretched, even managing to do a pirouette or two in the process. <laughs> okay, <laughs> it was clear that the spirit had moved in him and he needed to do something about it. And that's what he did. It, it, it was just remarkable to watch. That was his voice, right? That was how he chose to speak that day. Not too long after he got up, though, the pastor of that church quietly walked up to him, tapped him lightly on the shoulder, and whispered something in his ear. A rush of sadness came over his face, and he, he quietly sat down. I found out later that she'd asked him to sit down because that was not the right time to dance. The worship leaders of the church had never incorporated dance into the liturgy, and so it, it just wasn't done, right? Didn't matter that this was probably the first time he danced like that in at least a year. It didn't matter that the dance came directly out of being so moved by the worship experience that all he could do was dance. It didn't matter that he'd lost his voice in so many ways as a person living with AIDS and that his dance was his voice being heard. It had never been done and so it couldn't be done. This notion that we have to make room is no small task especially in the context of this and any community of faith, but it is possible, friends. It is possible. Do you hear me? Do we need to hear it again? It's possible. It is possible. It can be done. I've seen it done. One of my favorite people in the world, I read him all the time. I watch videos of him. His name is Vincent Harding. Vincent Harding was a historian and an author and a civil rights activist. He once said, I think that 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 determination to find a truly democratic society and to create the truly beloved community are things that can be available to us if we're willing to work with each other and to work with the universe on developing them. They don't come easy and free. They are, though, tough tasks for us to take on. But we can. And how? We start by finding more and more ways to honor our stories individual and collective. It's in our stories. Story is a source of nurture, right, that we cannot live without. We cannot become true human beings for ourselves and for each other without story. To find ways to tell it, to share it, to, to create it, to encourage it, allows a deep opening to take place. It brings together what I know and how I know and what I believe in and allows other folks to know that for themselves as well. And when we make room, we not only learn things, but we can also make way for healing and new beginnings. The stories of Hawaiian annexation were hard ones to read. I was particularly enraged by the fact that it was only in April of this year that the Hawaiian legislature apologized for legalizing the prohibition of the Hawaiian language in public schools, which we all know, right, was a part of a larger project. <laughs> that was a part of a larger project. Only this year. So I reached out to a friend who is native to these lands, asking if those in opposition to annexation were able to get their voices heard 
and he pointed me to our hymn of reflection today. Kaulana Napua, a protest song that was written around the time of annexation, um, I believe by someone named Ellen Wright Pendergrast. I am deeply grateful to Jackie Burke and Gabriel Diogonko for sharing it with us today. The invitation is to listen deeply to the voices found in their musical reflection. And my prayer for us is that we continue to grow in our awareness of what it means to have all the voices of this place represented and heard and remain ever mindful of building platforms for those voices less often heard, not just outside of this place, but right here, inside it as well. May it be so. Amen. <laughs>